to 10, at least for the beginning of today's lecture, we're literally going to discuss the most basic things about operators and how operators work. Okay, we're going to revise them as if we don't know they exist. Okay, um, and hopefully that'll give us a better idea going forward of what these things do, because it seems like on the mock test that was particularly setting people back. Hello, Thelma. Um, so yeah, page 10 of your textbook, please, guys. And yeah, and we'll get started with that. Okay, maybe that's why, because I think usually what we usually we have 12 or 13, right? So maybe some people didn't know that the time was changing, and that's why maybe some people thought today was cancelled or something. I don't know. All right. Uh, let me wait. You guys can't see my screen yet. Hey, no. Okay, share desktop. Cool. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Um, who's... I must be able to see the chat as well. All right. Okay, so there, the, the two main requests I got to cover um, as revision topics are what all of these different operators do. There's a lot of them, and we're going to cover all of them, like even the most basic ones. Okay. And um, so, yeah, we'll cover, we'll cover the operators, and then we're also going to cover the try catch statement okay because someone was also requesting that we cover that if anyone else has any things they would want to cover so you've we've gone through two tests together now right we went through the mock test and that test we went through in the previous week the knowledge assessment at the end of chapter one so if there is anything any of you still want to cover like if there's something you guys still aren't confident on then please, now's the time to ask these questions, okay? So while I go over operators, um, before we take a break, um, yeah, think about what other what other questions you might have and what, of the, what things in the course you're struggling with. And use the test to gauge those things, okay? The two tests, like try to think about the concepts that you're, you're struggling with. All right, but let's, let's discuss operators. Okay, so the five most basic operators, these ones hopefully we're going to be very familiar with by now. We're just going to go over them so that we can also discuss um, what types of operators there are and what we mean by the term arguments and operators and all of these different terms. Okay, so these five basic operators you should recognize. Okay, so there's the equal sign. All right, one equal sign. All right, there's the plus sign. Let me zoom in a bit because some students struggle to see. There's the minus sign. There's the asterisk and there's the slash. Okay, particularly these four correspond exactly to what you've done in any basic high school maths class or even primary school maths class already. Okay, these, these four secondary operators are just the plus sign is for addition, the minus sign is for subtraction, the asterisk is for multiplication, and the slash is for division. Okay, The equal sign is slightly different in programming to what we're used to outside. Okay, We've been exposed to it a lot by now, but I'm just starting with these basic operators so we can get an idea of how they work. All right, do, do the loops. Okay, we're going to do all the loops again. Okay, that's, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Would you like to go through that example where we go through the loop line by line again? Okay, we'll see about that. All right. Okay. So let's let's look at some of these operators. Okay, we'll start with this equal sign operator because it's kind of where we always start with our programming. Okay, what this equal sign does, one equal sign, is it takes, and we're going to start referring to these things by their proper names now, okay? So the equal sign will take the argument on the right, okay, and it will save it in the argument on the left. Okay, that's all the equal sign does. So let's go through an example of this. Again, super simple, and we've been exposed to it a lot, all right? So I'm going to create a variable, all right, int x, 
We're very comfortable with this by now. It's a data type followed by a variable name, all right? Um, equals six, okay? So this is a variable of type int and its value is six, okay? Its name is x, all right? So it took the thing on the right, six, and it saved it in the thing on the left, x. That's what this equals sign does, all right? So now when I print out, we know how to print out, right? Console.WriteLine x, okay? When I print out this variable, and when I print out that variable, it'll, it'll appear here. You can see it prints out its value, right? Six, okay? We can also, you've heard of this concept in computers, overwrite it, okay? So we can overwrite the value of x, all right? So on this first line, we created x and its value was six, okay? If I do this, if I say x equals three, all right, x equals three. So on this first line, we created the variable. Its name is x, its type is int, its value is six. On the second line, okay, we use the equal sign again. So what does the computer do? It takes the thing on the right, three, and it saves it in the thing on the left, x, all right? Now, x's previous value is just lost, okay? It's as if it was never there. It's overwritten with three, okay? So when I print this out, when I print out x, I get three, okay? So that's what the equal sign does. It just takes the thing on the right and saves it in the thing on the left, okay? Now, the thing on the right can also be a variable, Okay, so one simple way I can show this, if I make int y equals three, okay, so I've now got two variables, int x, okay, its value is six, int y, its value is three. If on this line I say x equals y, okay, then it will take the value of y, which is three, okay, so the thing on the right, and it will save it in the thing on the left, x. Okay, so x's value will be three, all right? If I do the reverse, if I say y equals x, okay, then when we finish running, okay, so now we created a variable, its value was six, we created another variable, y, and its value was three, but then the thing on the left, y, was overwritten with the value of x, okay? So y became six, all right, y became six. x, in this case, doesn't change, right? x's value is initially six, okay? And we say y equals x, okay? So the thing on the right is what is kept and it's saved in the thing on the left. So when we print out x, x's value in this case is still six, right? Because x is never overwritten here, okay? But if we print it out y, y's value will also now be six, right? Because it was overwritten with x, the thing on the right, okay? So that's how the equal sign works as an operator. Hopefully by now we're totally okay with this, okay? so. There's an, it's two, it has two arguments, right? That's, that's what we want to remember from this bit of the revision. The equal sign has two arguments, the thing on the right and the thing on the left. And what the equal sign does is it takes the thing on the right and it saves it in the thing on the left. All right, happy with that. Now, let's move on to one of these other operators. Okay, let's move on to another operator. Okay, so we're just going to go down this list, all right? So we've covered the equal sign. It just takes the thing on the right and saves it into the thing on the left. Okay. Let's now think about um, the plus sign. Okay. Now, hopefully everyone's pretty confident with what a plus sign does, right? Now, don't worry because it is, it is a little bit different in programming because we can use plus with variables. Okay, so in normal maths, you might be comfortable with something like three plus three, okay? But in programming, we can also have x plus three or x plus y, okay? And these variables are just placeholders. 
and they um, and they'll just merge them. Okay, they'll just merge them. So um, or yeah, they'll just add them together as usual. But they'll add them together on their value. Okay. So for example, if I say int x equals six, okay, int y here we have it equals to three. I'm going to change that. Okay. I'm going to say int y, and initially we're just going to keep it simple. I'm going to say int y equals 3 plus 5. Okay. And I'm going to print out both, both variables now. So I'm going to print out x on that first line there, and then I'm going to print out y. Okay. So this line will print out y, and this line will print out x. Nothing too hectic. Okay. So what do we expect to happen here? Int x equals 6. Okay. It's an equal sign. So it takes this thing on the right, the 6, and it saves it in x. Okay, so we're confident x's value will be 6. Okay, int y, okay, it's also an equal sign. So there's two arguments. There's something on the right of the equal sign, and there's something on the left of the equal sign. Okay, the thing on the, the, thing on the left is y, and the thing on the right is going to be saved into y. Okay, it's going to be saved into the thing on the left. All right, 3 plus 5, okay. This plus sign also has two arguments, okay? And just like the equal sign, it has an argument on the left and it has an argument on the right, okay? And it just adds them together. So int y equals 3 plus 5, okay? 3 plus 5 is just 8, okay? Hopefully we're very comfortable with that idea, okay? So 8, 3 plus 5, is going to be saved into y, and when I print it out here, y's value will be 8. Okay, so we get 6, that's the value of x, and then we get 8, the value of y. Okay, so that's addition. But like I mentioned, this can also work with variables, right, in, in programming. So if I change this 3 to an x, what happens then? Okay, what we must remember is that just like when I was saying int y equals x, Okay, like that, it's fine. It just takes the value of x, which is 6 at this point, and saves it in y, right? It just takes the thing on the right and saves it in the thing on the left. And so if I print out this, as we saw earlier, we just get 6, 6, okay? Ooh, uh, ignore that initial line. That was just a .NET fiddle thing, okay? So this just prints out 6, 6, okay? But if I then add that 5, okay, so x plus 5, what happens then? Okay, so it takes the value of x, which is 6 at this point, okay, and it just adds 5 to it, right? It takes the thing on the left and adds it to the thing on the on the right. That's what the plus sign does. And so we just get 6 plus 5, right? 11, okay? So that's the addition operator. Now, hopefully understanding addition and subtraction, we don't need much more of an explanation now of... Um, what subtraction does, right? The minus sign, okay? All this will do now is take the thing on the left and subtract from it the thing on the right, okay? So the thing on the left in this case was six, okay? And we were saying, so x here, this x is right here as well, okay? So this is just six minus five, okay? Which is one, okay? So we would want this to print out 6 and 1. All right, and that's what we get. Okay. Not too challenging. So now we've seen three different operators. And what do we notice? These All three of these different operators had two arguments, right? They'll have something on the left and they'll have something on the right. Okay. Cool. So let's look at these last two now. Okay, slightly more complicated, maybe. So um, let's make x3 now, okay? Int x equals 3, and we're going to say int x equals inc x times 5, okay? And that is what the asterisk means. You must just read it as times, okay? Or multiply, okay? X, x by 5, if you like, okay? Exactly, and it works exactly the same way as you would see it in maths class, okay? So... We created x, we know what the equal sign by does by now. It takes the thing on the right, 3, 
and saves it in the thing on the left x okay so now when when this programming when the when the computer reads x it just sees three okay just sees three so now when we say int y equals x times five okay what does the computer do instead of x it just sees, sees three currently right it just sees three so it goes three times five okay it takes the thing on the left and just multiplies it by the thing on the right okay that's all the asterisk sign does so in this case what would we want y to be 15 right three times five so if we run this we get three because it prints out x first right it prints out x which is still three x never changed why because after this first line x was never on the left of an equal sign right the only way we change these variables is if they're on the left of an equal sign x was never on the left of an equal sign and so it won't change okay there are other ways to change variables which we'll see later um, other operators um, but in in this case those operators weren't used okay so we printed out x and we got three okay when we print out y what was y's value right it's the thing on the right here the thing on the right of the equal sign x times five okay three times five and it prints out 15 okay and this will obviously work for any numbers if we say x times three that'll be three times three okay and it doesn't matter what's on the left or on the right the operator will always do the same thing it will take the thing on the left and multiply it by the thing on the right okay if it can't do it so let's say instead of three right there are other data types right this is an integer what if i said x times dog like a string like this you see it highlights it in red it says this can only be applied to um a type of int okay so it it knows okay it knows it won't allow you to do things that things like that okay so this just works with numbers if i say x times two it's just three times two okay so you just have to replace the variable with its value hopefully we're okay with that all right likewise um slash all slash means is divide you can kind of picture it like a fraction right so this is x over 2 right x slash 2 x divided by 2 what does that give us we would want it to be 3 okay so when i print out y i want it to be 3 and you see it is okay because x's value was originally 6 then we said y equals x x is 6 divided by 2 so it's just 6 divided by 2 that's 3 all right now hopefully you guys already see there's some things we have to be careful about here right these are integers these are integers um x and y are integers and what do we know about integers they don't hold decimal places right they don't hold decimal places integers um are just um whole numbers right well you know what i mean like they they don't have decimal places okay they're not decimal numbers all right they can be negative or positive but they have to be um you know okay so what does that mean right we we can hold the decimals inside floats and doubles these are data types that we're also familiar with but what if i say x is three here and then we say y equals x divided by two let's see how this breaks the computer okay so y equals x divided by 2 what is x it's 3 right 3 divided by 2 this should be 1.5 1 1.5 1 right 3 divided by 2 is 1.5 and yet for some reason the computer gives us 1 why is that well because they're integers right it just ignores anything that occurs after the 1 there are no decimal places okay anyway so these this is how these operators do work in a predictable way okay but what do we notice about these five operators there's something on the left and there's something on the right okay other than the equal sign okay the equal sign does something special it takes the thing in the right on the right and saves it in the thing on the left all of these other ones work exactly how you would expect them to work in normal mathematics okay in normal maths so um 
And when I say works exactly the same as they work in normal maths, um, I mean down to bod mass. Okay, you know what bod mass is, brackets of division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction. Okay, the computer knows this. Okay, C sharp knows bod mass as well, and it does apply it. Okay, so in order to see that, let's try saying 3 plus x times 2. Okay, so now we've got three operators on this one line. All right, we've got the equal sign. So what will this do? It'll take this thing on the right, all of it, 3 plus x times 2, and it's going to save that, whatever it gets. It doesn't care yet. It's, it'll evaluate it later. It's going to save this inside the thing on the left, okay, which is y. Okay, so what this equal sign is saying is y's value is this thing on the right. Okay, so what is this thing on the right? Let's, let's think about that, okay? We've got two operators here, a plus and an asterisk, okay? When the computer sees this, it does multiplication first, okay? So asterisk, x times 2. What is x's value? 3, right? So it just replaces this x with a 3, okay? 3 times 2 is 6. Then we look at this plus sign, okay? The plus sign, exactly the same way the asterisk works, it takes the thing on the right, which we've already seen was 6, okay? And it just adds it to the thing on the left. So we get 9, and when I print out x and y here, it prints out 3 for x, because x's value never changed from 3, and it prints out 9 for y, okay? So notice it, it does the multiplication first, and it'll do multiplication and division before it does addition and subtraction okay so we'll ignore the decimal place and it will give a whole yeah exactly Yuvia. um yeah so the integers it's not even like it's ignoring it it's not even doing it intentionally it just doesn't have a place for it it just doesn't exist okay so just don't even if it's an integer then decimal places just don't exist as far as c sharp is concerned okay but Maybe because this is revision, maybe we can look at something a bit interesting, okay? Because there is this issue um, maybe with learning operators. So the plus sign, as far as we're aware, should work exactly the same as it works in normal maths, right? But there is this question of what about these other data types, okay? So let's explore that problem a bit. Okay? We're not going to go too deep into it because it's not something that will be questioned of you a lot. But I do, what data type can hold decimals? Oh, come on, Yuvia, you should know the answer to that question. There are two of them. No, no, Saham. What do, what do, what holds? Okay, Yuvia, you know now. P please, share, share. Because <laughs> we have covered that a lot, right? It's double, exactly, Saham's right, it's double. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's no, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, double and floats, double and floats can hold decimals. Okay, we have covered that a lot though. All right, um, cool. But let's just um, okay. So what I wanted to explore now, okay, yeah, it's no problem. What do what so harm? What do bulls hold though? What do bulls hold? Do you remember? Okay, boolean, boolean, T N F. Yeah, exactly. True and false. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So now, what do I want to explore? Um, this plus sign it works the same way. If we have integers and even doubles, the plus sign, the minus sign, they all work the same way as we'd expect them to work in maths. Okay, all these operators. But what about with different data types? Like, what if I say string plus string? Okay. So because this is revision, I think we can maybe just touch on this like maybe more advanced idea. Don't worry about it too much because it's not the kind of thing that will be tested often. But I think it will give you a nice intuitive understanding for the way the, the way C sharp thinks. Okay, so let me let me remove this quickly. Okay, and we're just going to explore one more time what what one of these operators does. Okay, so cons console dot right line. Okay, so if I say 3 plus 5, okay, what does this plus sign operator do? It takes the thing on the right, 
and it adds it to the thing on the left. Okay. And you see it prints out eight. Okay, and if I add three, then this will just take take this plus sign, will take the thing on the left and add it to the thing on the right and get eight. And this plus sign will do the same thing. It'll take the thing on the left, okay, three plus five, <clears throat> which is eight, and add it to the thing on the right, 11. And so when we print this out, we get 11, exactly how the plus sign works in your head, okay? But these are all ints, right? So, I mean, I can trail on another int. We'll now get 15, right, plus four. And, and we're super happy with how the plus sign works normally, okay? Now, you know what this means, right? This is a string now. If I put something in two quotation marks, then I can give it a word. So here I've given it dog. Okay. So when I print this out, it prints out dog. Okay. What happens when we say dog plus cat? So string plus string. How does C sharp deal with this? Look at that, it just prints out dog cat, no space, right, no space. Okay, dog cat, right, so it just adds the strings together in a way. Hopefully you can see that, it's like, it, it's somewhat intuitive, it just goes, oh, these are two strings, and it just throws them together, slaps them together. Okay. <laughs> Quite a, it's, it's not necessarily intuitive, right, like, Maybe another programming language might go, instead it'll convert D, it's like the fourth letter of the alphabet or something, and try to convert them into numerical characters somewhere. Maybe some other programming languages will find where these strings are in the computer's memory and add their locations together, perhaps. Like a bunch of, there's a bunch of different ways you could think about a plus sign, okay? So it's not really similar to, what, what do you mean? Oh, 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 you mean like how strings are arrays? So the zeroth element in a, in a string will be its first letter. Hmm. Actually, yeah, interesting, interesting observation. So, I mean, these things are handled in specific ways, right? It is its own data type in the end. Yeah. But I, it's just like, okay, how do we handle adding two, two arrays of chars together? But that's getting too technical, I think. Just think about this intuitively. If we're adding two words together, one way we could picture doing that is to just throw the words together. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no way, yeah. So it made it one, it made it one, yeah. It made it one string, basically. It just concatenated them, we call it. Concatenated the strings together. Okay, so we've got dog, cat. What if I wanted a space here? What if I wanted a space? Well, I could just put a space in the string, right? Like that. So I just put a space after the word dog, and now we get dog space cat, okay? See, so it literally just takes the string, literally, and just adds it on, okay? So if I made it um, like a first and first, a uh, first and second name, we'll use Saham. Did I spell your surname correctly? Yeah, that's right. Okay, you see, I, I didn't put a space after Saham, right? Didn't put a space. There's no space inside the inside the um, quotation mark, okay? And there also isn't a space outside here. So we get it as one word, okay? But if I put a space here, all right, then we get a space, okay? Likewise, if I put a space here, then we get a space. So it just adds the two adds the two strings together. Okay, just throws them on the end of each other, and you can do that with as many strings as you like, just like numbers. Okay, so this is why the plus sign it's special in a way. Having operators in in a computer is somewhat different. So the plus sign works the same as we think about it in the normal world um, by just adding two numbers together. But when we're adding a string to a string, then things get a little bit complicated. Okay. But not two, it's still intuitive. It's still intuitive. What if we use a minus sign? I I think it'll break. It'll break. Um it won't be defined. Yeah, compilation error. Operator minus cannot be applied to operands of type string. Okay. 
So it's just saying, I can't do that. I don't know what that means. Which also makes sense, right? Because you kind of go like, how would, how would you define that? Would you take the letters in the one and remove them from the other one? It would be a whole mission, right? So um, yeah, that's not defined. Okay, but those are the five most basic operators. Okay, those are the five most basic operators. Equals, plus, minus, asterisk, slash. Sorry we didn't go through them in that much detail earlier on in the lesson, I mean earlier on in the course, but there will always be one of these per lesson. <laughs> so, sorry we didn't go um, through those earlier in the course, but hopefully now they must make very clear sense to you. Okay, those five. All right. Now we also have some other interesting ones that we've spent a lot of time looking at, okay, and that are asked a lot about in the course, okay. Um, now, the other thing I want you to remember quickly before I show you these next six operators is that all of the operators we've seen so far, x um, equals, plus, minus, asterisk, and slash, they all had two arguments, okay, something on the right and something on the left. The thing on the right could be a really long thing with other operators. That doesn't matter. It can handle that. But there's something on the right and something on the left. Okay. You can't have X plus and then nothing. Okay. The computer won't know how to handle that. All right. There has to be something on the right of that one plus sign. Okay. And likewise for the minus sign and the asterisks and the all of them. There's something on the left, something on the right. Okay. So, um, let's look into these other ones, all right? Um, some of the other ones that we've seen a lot are this, this sign, okay? A sort of rightwards pointing arrow, okay? Um, we can call these greater than, the greater than sign and the less than sign, okay? Um, less than and then an equal sign, okay? greater than and then, and then an equal sign. Oh, and guys, the, the arrow has to come first. The equal sign has to come after the arrow. Okay, so it's less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. Okay, we also have two equal signs. Okay, having two equal signs is different. So just having one. Okay, and we also have an exclamation point and then an equal sign. Okay. So this, this is what we're going to deal with now. Right. We're going to look at these now. So these are what we might call... Okay, they're calling them here relational. I, I think that's cool. Sometimes they're called Boolean, and sometimes they're called relational. Okay? Um, but Or sometimes they're even called ordering. Okay, because they show you the order that numbers go in, like this one's less than this one, or this one's greater than this one. Okay, but we're just going to call them, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with the book name. They say relational operators, okay? So these are relational operators. They aren't that different, okay? They aren't that different to um, the operators we've seen. And what I mean by that is they still only have two arguments, okay? There's something on the left, and there's something on the right. It's just what they do with those two arguments is slightly different. Okay. Hopefully this won't take us too long to go over. But if I say, oh, actually, because we were discussing it earlier, let me create a bool. Okay. We haven't seen these much. Okay. So we've got bool and I'll say, what should we call our bool? Check. Okay. Bool check. Something like that. Cool. So I've created a variable. Its name is check and its type is bool. Right. So what can bools hold? We've seen they can hold true. Okay. And you see C sharp highlights the word true in blue here. Okay. The word, the word true is highlighted in blue. Likewise, if I type false, you can see the word is highlighted in blue. What does that mean? Just like all these other ones, using public class, C sharp knows this word. Okay, false is a reserved word. It knows what it means. Okay. So if I say console dot right line 
um, check. All right. Okay, you see it prints out false. Okay, and that's because the value of check is false. Okay, but it's this is a special kind of false. Okay, it's a special kind of false. So it's not like because you see I could put this word inside I, like let me let me explain to you what I mean by that. If I print out like this. Okay, in curly brackets. You see it prints out the same thing. Okay, but these are different. Okay, I want you to know that they're different. Okay, one of them is a string, the other one is a bool. Okay, the word false inside a boolean means something different to the word false inside a string. Okay. In the same way as something like maybe even easier to picture. If I say zero inside these inside these quotation marks and say, or let's use the ones we used before. So I'll say three plus three. Okay, but you see they're inside quotation marks. Okay. We've seen what happens when we add strings together, right? When we added dog and cat, it just attached the strings together, right? It just attached them together. When we added two numbers, three and three, it would make six, okay? These are in quotation marks. So what will this print out? It'll print out three, three, okay, 33. But remember, it's not the number 33, if you, if you understand me, it's the type, okay? We're thinking about the type here. It's not an integer 33, okay? It's a string. So when you add a string to a string, even if the string is holding a number like it just was three, it's not going to add the numbers together. It doesn't see them as numbers. Okay. So you see it prints out 3, 3. But if I remove the quotation marks, so they're now integers, you can see it prints 6. Okay. So hopefully you're comfortable when I say, like, when it prints out false here, it's printing out a Boolean. Okay. It's not printing out just the word false. It's like this... It's, it realizes that the, the, the statement is false. Like, the it's a Boolean, okay? It's not just a string holding the word false. Okay, that's just what I want to clarify. All right. So, bool check equals false. If I print out check, you can see we get false. Again, not the string false, though. It's like an actual false. Okay. So, how can we use this? All right. How can we use this? So I'm going to do something to show this that I haven't done before, but I think it'll make more sense. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm going to put an if statement here. Okay, I'm going to put an if statement here. We're familiar with if statements by now, hopefully. What will the if statement do? The, the understanding we have so far is that the thing inside these normal brackets is checked. Right? Whatever you put inside that normal bracket is checked. And if it's true, okay, but like Boolean true, okay, so as in actually true, um, or then the code here will be run. Okay. If it's false, if the thing inside these brackets is false, then we go to the else statement, okay, and we run this code. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a chair, I'm gonna say console dot right line, and I'm just gonna print out a string in each case. Okay, so I'm here I'm gonna say um, check is true. Okay, and here I'm gonna print out console dot right line. I'm gonna say check is false. All right, and here inside the if statement, I'm just going to put check. Okay. Check. So are we happy with what's there so far? I think so. Okay, so when I run this, you see check is false. Okay, 
So it goes, if check, what is check? Check is false, okay? And it's Boolean false. So it goes to the else statement, and it prints out, console.writeLine, check is false. That's what should happen, right? And let's see, when I run this, you see it prints out, check is false. If I change check to true, okay, what happens now? Well, it just prints out, check is true. Okay, that's, it goes to the if statement, it checks check, check is true, so it runs this first block. Okay, and we print out check is true. Okay, nothing too hectic. What these operators allow us to do, these greater than, less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equals, equals, and not equals, when we have exclamation points equals, we can say not equals. Um, what these do is allow us to, uh, they're called relational, okay? So they allow us to relate different numbers to one another um, in a way that will either produce a true or false statement, okay? So let's go through our first one, this, this first one. Like all the other operators we've seen so far, it takes two arguments, okay? This, this sideways arrow, okay? This one that's facing right, the, the gr um, greater than sign, if you like, it's usually called. So this greater than sign has something on the left and something on the right. Okay, so if I say 5 on the left and 3 on the right, okay, 5 on the left and 3 on the right, okay, what this does is it says, okay, if the thing on the left of me is larger, is greater than the thing on the right of me, then this whole thing just becomes true. Okay? It just becomes true. If the thing on the left of me, left of me, so 2 now, is less than, or rather is not greater than, the thing, <clears throat> the thing on the right, then I return false. Okay? So here we say 2 greater than 3. Is this statement true or false? It's false, right? Okay, so this should return false. And then we save false in this Boolean variable. So Boolean, it holds true or false. We save it in this Boolean variable called check. Then we say if check. Check now should be false, right? So we should go to the else, else statement and we should print out check is false. So when I run this, see it prints out check is false. So that's working how we intend. Okay. Now if I change this to 4, okay, 4 greater than 3, is this statement true or false? Okay, so the thing on the left must be larger than the thing on the right of this operator. Okay. 4 is greater than 3. This is true. Okay, so when I run this, it prints out check is true. Okay, because this variable check is now holding something true. All right. If I change this to a 3, okay, is 3 greater than 3? No. No, right? This is false. This is false. And so when I run this, check is false. Okay, 3 is not greater than 3. It's equal to 3. All right. Hopefully we're super happy with that. That's all that's all those operators are doing. Okay, it takes the thing on the left and compares it, relates it to the thing on the right, and then says either true or false. Okay, and that's all it can say. All of these operators, there's always one of two options. Okay, it's either true or it's false. There's no middle ground. Okay. So that's the first one. Let's look at the second one. Okay, so if I say less than. Okay. Exactly the same, basically. It's just reversed. Okay, so now it's just saying the thing on the left of me must be smaller than the thing on the right of me. Okay, if the thing on the left of me is smaller than the thing on the right, then I return true. Okay, so if I say 3 less than 4, is that statement true? 3 is less than 4, right? So it returns true and we say check is true. Okay, if I say 4 less than 10, still true. 
right? Four is definitely less than 10. So when I run this, it goes check is true. Okay. If I say 10 less than 10, this now is false, right? 10 is not less than 10. It's equal to 10. Okay. So like when we said three is greater than three and 10 is less than 10, you can see these are maybe a bit weird cases, right? There's some times when actually I would want that to be true. Okay, what if I do want the if statement, what if I do want check to be true when the numbers, when the thing on the left is equal to the thing on the right or less than? You could see how that would be useful. And that's why these next two operators exist. Okay, and they're quite intuitive really, right? Less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Okay, so let's go through some examples of this. If this is 9, let's say, 9 less than or equal to 10. Okay, that's true, right? 9 is less than or equal to 10. So when I run this, it says check is true. If I say 11, 11 is not less than or equal to 10, obviously. So this prints out check is false. If I say 10, this time this is true, right? 10 is less than or equal to 10. So it says check is true. Okay. And the greater than one works the same way. Okay, you're just comparing the thing on the left to the thing on the right. Right. And we don't have to put this in a separate Boolean variable. I'm just doing this to show it like this. We could also throw this operator. Okay, remove all that and just throw it directly in here. Right, instead of check. Okay. Hopefully you're comfortable with what just happened there, right? Because this is just a Boolean. It just evaluates to true or false. Okay. You could see if we said without the operator, if we just try to say like if 10, then it goes, what? What does this even mean? This is an integer. And the if statement is expecting a Boolean. It needs either true or false. Okay. So now it's okay. All right, and then there's these two more operators. There's these two other operators. Equals, equals. Okay, so all this is doing is take the thing on the left. If it's the same as the thing on the right, then I return true. Okay, otherwise I return false. So in this case, 10 equals equals 9. This is false, right? Check is false. Okay, 10 does not equal 9. If we say literally any other number except 10, um, this will always be false. But as soon as I put a 10 there, now it's true. Okay, and it'll say check is true. All right. Happy with that. Okay, and the not equals is the same. So this is just saying whenever the thing on the left is not the same, as the thing on the right, I return true. Okay, but when the thing on the left is equal to the thing on the right, I return false. So 10 not equal to 10. That's false, right? 10 is equal to 10. Right. And if I say 9, 9 isn't equal to 10. So this is now true. And you see a pencil check is true. Okay. And like with our other operators, the thing on the left can be a variable, right? If I say int x equals 9 and replace this 9 here with an x, this is the same. Okay, x is just a placeholder. It's just representing something. Okay, you can see check is still true, right? 9, x is just 9 and 9 is not the same as 10. So this is still true. Okay, cool. So those are our next, those operators hopefully we're comfortable with. They're just for relating things together, okay? Um, technically, so the equals and equals and not equals, they call that equality. Um, so it's testing for different types of equality, right? So equals equals is making sure they're the same. Not equals is making sure they're not the same. Okay. Cool. Um, oh, and I guess what one more thing that might be interesting. You can see if I say dog equals equals cat. 
You can see this says false. If I change that to dog, you can see it says true. Okay, so it works with strings as well. All right. This is not good practice. You shouldn't use this because strings are a bit iffy sometimes, but um, in principle, this is okay. Okay, it works. So if the string on the left is the same as the string on the right, then this will return true. But if I add a space after dog, those strings now aren't the same, right? The check is false. Okay, even though they both say dog, this dog has a space here and space counts. Okay, likewise, if this was a capital D, these strings are not the same. These strings are not the same. Okay. Anyway. Cool. So, those are the operators I wanted to revise mostly. There was, there was also two other special operators. I'm going to go through them before we take a break. Okay. So, all of the operators we've covered so far, we've covered 11 of them, right? equals, plus, minus, asterisk, slash. I can't get into the call, sir. Please add me. Huh. Uh, ask to join. I'll do the same with can you. Okay, we're up to 16 now, so I take it the rest of the squad is here. All right, so, um, hmm. uh, what were we talking about again? All right, so all of the operators we've covered so far, okay, equals, plus, minus, asterisk, slash, and also less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equals, equals, and not equals, all of these have had two arguments, right? Something on the left and something on the right, okay? There are two other operators that I want to cover now, okay, two other operators that don't follow that, okay, that don't have two arguments, one on the left and one on the right. Okay. The first one, you have seen both of these operators before, and we've covered them before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them, and then we'll take a quick break after I finish covering these. Uh, please mute your mic, whoever that is, because there's background noise. I think Benele, let me just... Okay, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to cover these quickly, but we're not going to, um, yeah, I, we, we have seen them before. Okay, so plus plus. Okay, this is the first one. So this is an operator like the other operators we've seen. Okay, but this operator doesn't have an argument on the left and the right. Okay, this operator has an argument on the left um but so like left or the right okay but not left and the right okay so um let's let's explore what i mean by that okay so um i'm gonna say int x equals three okay so i've created a variable x okay i'm gonna say um, i'm gonna print out x Print out x. So when I print out x, you can see x's value is 3 currently. Hopefully, we are extremely happy with why that's the case, okay? It's just because of that line there, right? The equal sign took the thing on the right and saved it in the thing on the left, okay? Going back to the previous, op one of the previous operators we so we've seen, we could say something like x equals x plus 1, right? So what is this doing? This equal sign takes the thing on the right, all of this, and saves it in the thing on the left. Okay? X. So it takes, it needs to figure out what this is. So it looks at the plus sign. Okay? What does that operator do? It takes the thing on the left, X, X's value is 3, and it adds it to the thing on the right. Okay? So X plus 1, we get 4, and when I run this, we print out 4. Okay? The plus plus sign is a little bit of a foster way of doing this, okay, in a way. But there are some special cases that we need to think about, okay? So if I say x++, plus plus, that's what this operator does, okay, x++, plus plus, 
it is just going to print out 4. Okay, you see it still prints out 4. So whatever x was, if I make x minus 1, it will print out 0. Okay, Whatever x was, it will just add 1 to it. So if I make x 11, it's going to print out 12 now. Okay, Because this line goes and does x equals x plus 1. Okay, So notice, unlike the other operators that we've seen, this operator doesn't have something on the left and the right. Okay, It just has this x. x is just on the left. Okay. Um, so with this plus plus operator, you can put x on the left or you can put the x on the right. Okay. So you see it's not complaining now. Okay, so plus plus x. So when I run this, you can see it's still just adding 1 to whatever x is. Okay, so if I make x3, this prints out 4. If I make x5, this prints out 6. Okay. Not, not too bad, right? Not too bad. Cool. Now, with this operator, so you can see it only has one argument. It either has something on the left or it has something on the right. Okay. But there is a slight difference, okay? between putting the argument on the left of the operator and the argument on the right of the operator. Okay. So what is that difference? That's what we are going to explore now. Okay. So I've got int x equals 5 here. Okay. And I'm going to print out x. So you can see it just prints out 5. Okay. If I print out x plus plus, okay, We've seen what this does now, right? It only has the one argument on the left, and it adds 1 to x. Okay? But what... We saw that, right? If I put if I put the x++ plus plus here, it added 1 to x, and when I printed out x, x was 1 greater than it was, right? We saw that lots just now, okay? But if I put the x++ plus plus inside the print statement, that's what we want to see what happens now. So int x equals 5, this prints out 5. Okay, You see x's value was initially 5. If I put the x++ plus plus here and put just the x in here, you can see it prints out 6. Okay, But if I put the x++ plus plus in here, it prints out 5. Okay, So this is the case we're examining now. Right? Now what if... So you see the operators on the right here. What if I put the operator on the left? Okay, so now the argument is on the right. Now when I run this, you see it prints out 6. Okay. So what what is going on there? That's, that's what we want to see. Okay. Now, in order to show this, I'm going to, on the next line as well, so I'm going to say console.write line, I'm going to print out x again. Okay, so we start with x being equal to 5, right? Then we run this line. We say console.write line plus plus x, okay? This plus plus x adds 1 to x, and then we read the value of x, and we get 6. Okay, perfect. On the next line, when I print out x, x's value is still 6, obviously. Okay, But when I say x++, plus plus, so when the argument is on the left, the x is on the left instead of on the right, now when I run this, you can see it prints out 5 on that first line. Okay, But when I get to the next line, x's value is still 6. Okay, So what happened? What happened? Hopefully you can see what is happening. Okay, So when the argument is on the left, 1 is still added to it, but its value is returned before we add the 1. Okay, let me look in the chat. Hopefully people are gelling with this. Okay, cool. So 
hopefully it's it's added before okay so cool so if we put the arguments on the left then the value of x which is 5 right is returned so we get 5 and then the plus plus then the computer sees the plus plus and goes oh i have to add one to x okay if i put the plus plus first then it sees the plus plus and it goes, oh, cool, I must add one to whatever argument I got. And it adds one to x. And then it goes, oh, and also return the value of x. Okay. So that's all this is doing. Now, in your test, you, you got this question. Okay. So let me, let me write it how it was in the test. I said int x equals 20. Okay. Int y equals <clears throat> x plus plus plus, um, let's say, 5. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to say um, console, I'm going to print out y here. Okay, console.write line. Now, it looks more complicated, but guys, don't think about it just in terms of that, okay? Think about it in terms of applying what you know, okay? So individually, you know what the plus sign does. You know what the equal sign does. You know what plus plus does. So just think about it how you know the computer thinks about it. Okay, so let's go through it line by line and try to predict what y will be. Okay, so if I say int x equals 20, okay, what is this doing? The equal sign just takes the thing on the right and it saves it in the thing on the left. Okay, so x's value is just 20. That's all that line is saying. Okay. We come to this next line now, y equals x plus plus, we know this is an operator, that plus plus is an operator, and plus 5, okay, plus is also an operator, okay, so what's happening here, this equal sign is just going to take this thing on the right, and it's going to save it in the thing on the left, okay, and we want to know what y's value will be, okay, so this is quite a simple question, all we have to do is figure out what this is, what is this value? Okay, cool. So let's look at it, um, how the computer will look at it. It sees the plus sign. Okay, so it goes, okay, I must take the thing on the left and I must add it to the thing on the right. Okay, what is the thing on the left? What does the computer get? Okay, so the computer goes through it. It sees X, all right. So it sees X, it goes X's value is what? 20. Cool, then it goes plus plus. Okay. Cool. So it adds 1 to x, but remember, it's already returned the 20. Okay, it's already seen the 20. It's, um, how do I put this? Um, just like when, hmm, hmm, yeah, just like just like this idea that if it's not on the left of the equal sign, it, it can't go up, right? So um, x's value here was the computer already saw that x was 20, okay? And it's already read that. There was no going back, okay? When it added 1 to x, it had already read x's value. So it goes, okay, this it has read as 20, okay? It also added 1 to x, but that was a separate thing. Okay. It's already read x++ plus plus as being x's value, which was 20. Okay. And then it adds 5 to 20 and we just get 25. Okay. So when we print this out, we get 25. And hopefully you guys saw that because we have seen this exact question before. Okay. If I say plus plus x instead, okay, what happens now? Now when it sees this, it goes, okay, it sees the plus plus first. So it goes, okay, I must add 1 to this argument x. And then it reads x and goes, okay, x is 21. And then adds 5 to it. Okay, And so we get 26. Right, then y's value is 26. So with all these questions, and there were a lot of these questions in the test, and some people really struggled with them. But what you must, what you must really understand is that the question with with all these questions of what will the variables value be at the end all you have to do is look at the last equal sign 
okay and just find out what that thing on the right is equal to okay and maybe you'll have to look at like the previous equal signs to figure out what this one is equal to but it's it's not difficult okay those questions are not difficult you just have to figure out which equal sign they're asking you about okay so here if I was asking you about y you just have to figure out what the thing on the right of this equal sign okay what is this equal to if I was asking you about what is x's value at the end of this ooh, actually that's a good question what is x's value when this code stops running look carefully okay look carefully so we say int x equals 20 okay so we take the thing on the right make it equal to the thing on the left okay or sorry other way around okay so x becomes 20 this line here okay this is a bit tricky so um yeah so this plus plus x adds one to x as well okay so look if i say x plus plus here okay so like this so we get 25 at the end of this it reads x as 20 it adds 1 to x and then it adds 5 to what it read okay remember it's adding 1 to x it's not adding 1 to the thing it read okay when i print out x at the end of this instead of y x's value is 21 okay x's value is 21 because of this plus plus the operator still works Okay. So C# -sharp applies these rules very consistently. Okay? It always goes, okay, um the plus plus sign, it takes the argument. If the argument is on the left, then it reads first and then adds 1. If the argument is on the right, it adds 1 and then reads. Okay? But it's always going to add 1. That's what the plus plus does. That's what that's what its purpose is, okay? Just like the equal sign. All of these uh, like there's a bunch of other things that could happen around it but the equal sign what it does is it takes the thing on the right of it however long it is doesn't matter and it saves it in the thing on the left that's all the equal sign does and it'll do that in every case okay and likewise with all these other things the greater than sign whatever is on the left it can be like 5 plus 6 plus x plus y times 3 whatever whatever is on the left of the, this greater than sign It'll just say, is this greater than the thing on the on the right of me? Okay, if it is, then it's true. Doesn't matter how long these things are, the rules are consistent. Okay. And you can like stack these operators on top of each other. Okay. We have been going for like 70 minutes now, so I think a break. I also rarely need a glass of water. When I come back, I'm gonna talk about the ternary operator. That's the last operator we're gonna be talking about, because those are the ones you will be tested on. Okay. Um, we might have to look at some others later in chapter two, um, but we'll think about those when we get there. Okay. Um, for now, these 12 operators, um, the break will be, let's say, five minutes. We don't want to go too long because I do want to get through a bit more. Okay. Um, yeah. But then the other thing that I, yeah, there's other things that I wanted to mention as well. Okay, but then we'll also go through the try catch statement. Someone was asking for us to go through loops again. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, but guys, in the in those questions of the loops in the test, a lot of you finished that test very early, and that's bad. Okay, because those loops, there is no way you could read them in the time that you guys finished. All right. So with those loops. You must write out the code. Like when we reviewed it, you must take a piece of scrap paper, like when we went over the test, and you write out the code, right? So line one, you put it in line one. Line two, you put that in line two. And so that you can actually see and read the code, okay? And you must take your time with those tests. Even though it's multiple choice, it doesn't mean it's easy, okay? No, oh, oh yeah, yeah, eventually. Yeah, not today, but eventually, yes. Um, I mean, some of them are just self-explanatory, but we won't, yeah, and some you won't really be using often, okay, so we don't have to think too much about it, okay, um, but, but in the more complicated examples we do later, yeah, they, they will come up, okay, I'm gonna go get some water, 
we'll reconvene at quarter past four. Okay, I'm starting exactly at quarter past four because we have a lot to finish still. Okay. Oh, water. Great. Uh, it's not my dog. Neighbor's dog. Although I think it might have been the neighbor coughing, not the neighbor's dog barking. I'm not sure. I heard a lot of coughing, not barking. Don't think it's Corona, though. Although they have been leaving the house a lot. Hmm. Oh, guys, um, if you're not on the WhatsApp group, please, in Microsoft Teams, DM me your number so I can add you to it. Okay. Because it is very important that you join the WhatsApp group, like now. Because that's how we've been communicating. So I'm going to get started again. If you're not here, sorry. <laughs> um, I, the thing we're starting with is easy, though. And, well, it's not easy, but the level we need to know it to is very easy. Okay, so um, it's just the ternary operator. Okay, I would cover this in detail, but we don't really have the time. Since this is a revision thing, there are videos where we go slightly more into detail about what this is. Okay, so... You know, the other operators we've seen now, we've seen a lot of them. I'll quickly write them out. Okay, equals, plus, minus, um, asterisk, slash, uh, greater than sign, less than sign, 
less than less than or equal to sign greater than or equal to sign equals equals and not equals okay and plus plus okay these are all the operators we've seen you should know the meaning and you should know how to interpret like chains of these quite easily okay so we know the meaning of all of these different operators now okay what so except for this last one the plus plus okay all of these operators had two arguments right something on the left of them and something on the right of them those things those arguments can be long and complicated but they're always there's always two of them with these operators okay something on the left something on the right okay the plus plus sign was a bit special okay plus plus has one argument it's either on the left or it's on the right and all it does is add one to that argument if the argument is on the left though then it reads the thing before it adds one to it if the argument is on the right then it adds one before it reads it okay quite simple this last argument this last operator that we're looking at okay question mark colon has three arguments okay so it'll have arguments one and this just like an if statement this argument one has to be a boolean a boolean all right boolean argument one okay then after the question mark it has another argument so we'll call this hopefully it's not a surprise to anyone we're going to call that one argument two okay and then we have an argument three okay fantastic all right so this is how the question mark colon works all right so you have an argument question mark another argument colon and another argument okay it just has three arguments and that is literally all i want you to know about the ternary operator you don't even have to in fact you don't even have to know this bit you don't even have to know that the first one is boolean all i want you to be able to do with the ternary operator and you can tell even by its name right it almost sounds like trio ternary triple you know like it's it sounds like three okay there's three right it's similar to okay so it has how many arguments does the ternary operator have three okay yeah it sounds like tertiary exactly tertiary yeah all these all these like three words does binary operator have it doesn't have two oh uh binary operator so you're asking about yeah yeah like those equals equals greater than yeah something on the left something on the right right something on the left something on the right so the greater than is is what we might call a boolean operator and it has something on the left and something on the right but the reason we call it boolean isn't because two okay we call it boolean because it outputs true or false okay so if i put a greater than sign between two arguments like whether they're numbers or variables or whatever what that does is it tells me is the statement true or false so that's why that greater than sign is called a boo uh, a, like a binary operator okay oh binary operator you're asking i i don't know we let's see are you getting that from the book somewhere yeah so the book doesn't mention binary operator so where where are you where is this mentioned Yeah, all the operators are on page 10, Saham. So there's no there's no binary operator. But like there's there's um oh I guess there is in a way. But no, we're not we're not talking about that yet. Okay, that's called shifting. But we don't wanna like the the point of this is not getting confused. Okay, the point is understanding the basics of the course. That's what we're gonna do today. Okay. So th the operators that we have now these are the ones we want okay there's the thing on the left thing on the right okay and they all have different meanings you don't even have to know what they're called except for the ternary operator okay so this ternary operator you should know what it does it just replaces an if statement right it's an if statement on one line but we don't care about that even okay all i want you to know about the ternary operator is from the word ternary just know that it has three arguments okay like tertiary okay there's three three 
three arguments. The ternary operator has three arguments, and it is the only operator. The ternary operator is the only operator that has three arguments. Okay. So that's the, and that's the only question you'll get about it. They'll ask you something like, how many arguments does the ternary operator have? And you have to say three, or they'll say, what is the only operator that has three arguments? And you need to say ternary. Okay. That's what I want you to be able to know about the ternary operator. All of the other operators we've covered today, you must know, like the back of your hand. Okay. Equals, plus, 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 asterisk, slash, greater than, less than, or equal to. Please know how to interpret when that operator is being used. But understand, you must take your time. Okay. Just because it's a multiple choice test or something like that, you must still be patient with it. Work through each question. Okay. The questions, I, I think probably last week's test showed you that. The questions are deceptively difficult. Okay. They're easy if you spend the time on them, like we did after you guys wrote the test. But while you were writing, a lot of you clearly struggled. Okay. So please take your time with it. Don't rush. Um, and just because it's a multiple choice test, don't think the marks are free. Okay. Anyway. Cool. So let's quick. I want to look at the try catch because people are con continually bringing up how the try catch works. Um, and this time, I think I have an example to show you maybe like what you really need to know about the try catch. You don't have to know how to use it perfectly in a business context. Obviously, it has a billion uses and you'll never learn about all of them in one course, right? That'll take years and years and years of work experience. So you got cut off again. Oh, um, Okay, let me Okay. Um so uh, let me also I need to take a print screen now, actually. Ask to join. Uh okay, they're being added. Alright. Um so Cool. Uh, what were we thinking about now? Right, try-catch. People are asking about the try-catch. We can never teach you every single purpose of a try-catch. They're very, they're widely used, very difficult to um, figure out. Okay, cool. Um, but the thing we need to know about the try-catch is actually quite simple. Okay, it's a very simple flow. It makes sense in terms of the words that we use in try, catch, finally. Okay, just think about what the words mean and think about generally what the blocks are doing. You don't have to know the super specific usage. Okay, so I, there's an example that I think might help in understanding that. Okay, so what we are talking now that I'll put in the little comment here. Okay, the slash slash, hopefully you guys know it means comment. So it's just, it's words that aren't read as code. Okay, they're not aren't read as code. They're just there to make it look pretty. Okay, for titles like this. Okay, so we're talking about the try catch finally statement. Okay, so in order to give you an example of this, we're going to start out with something super simple that we're all familiar with. Okay, so I'm going to create, I'm actually not even going to tell you, I, I hope you can just interpret it. Okay, so the word string, square brackets, names, equals... Cool. Hopefully you know what that is. Okay, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm not even going to tell you what that is. Yeah, cool. Array. It's an array. Correct. It's an array of names. More specifically, it's an array of strings. Okay. How many elements does this array have? Oh, I can just show it to you. Hopefully we can see and I don't have to tell you this. Okay. It has two, of course, right? Two. Saham Benele. Okay. Um... Yeah, two of them. Okay, where do we ca start counting? So, so hum, right, the first entry in the array, what number in the array is that? Zero, exactly. So, when I go console.write line, names in position zero, what should I expect to get? So hum, right? When I do names in position one, what do I get? Benele. Okay. If I do names in position two, what happens now? 
Okay, if I say names in position two, right, there is no third element. So yeah, in a way you hear nothing, but more specifically, everything just breaks. Okay, so it crashes. Okay, the code crashes. That's what we could say. Like your computer can crash. Okay, when something goes wrong, and when it crashes, it throws what we call an exception. Okay, programmers call them exceptions. Normal people might call them errors. Okay, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's it's thrown an exception. Okay, so it says index was outside the bounds of the array. Okay, so when when it says index, what is our index? Our index is two. Okay, where we're indexing. That's what they say, indexing the array. Okay, our index two was outside the bounds of the array. What does it mean by that? It means we're trying to access something that isn't in the array. Okay, it's outside the bounds. Okay, so cool. So the code crashed. That's not good, right? Like as a programmer, I don't want the code to crash. Okay, so let me give you a simple example. Let's say we're coding up um, this program, and all it has to do is read a position from an array and then say goodbye. Okay, that's what we want our code to do. Okay, uh, but it's very important that it says goodbye because it's rude not to say goodbye. Okay, so it must say goodbye. All right. So let's see how we would do this. Okay, I'm going to access names in position one. Okay, so all our code needs to do is it finds its position, finds this position in the array. It doesn't matter what it is, one in this case. It prints it out, Benele. But then we need to say goodbye, right, to our user. We need to say cool console dot right line. Okay, and it's going to say goodbye. And let's say thank you. We'll be super polite. Thank you for using our program. Okay, exclamation point. There we go. Cool. So now when we run our code, it goes goodbye. It says Benele, prints out the entry in the array, and then it says goodbye. Thank you for using our program. Okay, very polite. Very polite. Okay. I did spell it right, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, cool. Now, oh, oh, you're saying on the mic. Oh, right. Okay. So, um... Cool. Are we happy with what this code is doing? Okay. So all it's, but it's very important that we say goodbye. So let's see what happens now. So I'm going to, hold on. Let me just make it so that .NET Fiddle gets rid of this because there shouldn't be an error there. There we go. Cool. So let's see what happens now when I print out array in position two. Okay. So array in position zero would say, so hum, goodbye. Thank you for using our program. Array in position one would say, Benele, goodbye. Thank you for using our program. Cool. What will names in position two do? It just breaks and just destroys itself. And it doesn't print out. It doesn't say, goodbye, thank you for using our program. You see, it doesn't do that at the end there. It doesn't say goodbye. That's rude, right? Even if our code breaks, we still want to say goodbye, thank you for using our program. You know, maybe we even want to say, sorry, sorry, our program broke. Okay. Instead of printing out the person's name, we just want to be like, sorry, our program broke. Cool. So let's let's do that. All right. So how do we fix this? Okay. We use what's called the try catch finally statement. Okay. So this part of our code here, where we access the array, it's possible that sometimes we access the array in the wrong place. Okay. But when we do that, we don't want our code to just break. We want to say, you know, sorry, we broke, and goodbye. Thank you for using our program. Okay. So how do we do this? Okay, so we create what's called a try catch statement. Okay, so we say try. Okay, try the word try. And as usual, when we're specifying some code inside a block, we use these curly brackets. Okay, and I just put the code I want to try inside it. Okay, so we're going to create this array names. Okay, with Ben and Saham. And we can add as many names as we want to eventually. Okay. And I'm going to access the array in a certain position. It might break. It might cause an error. But the big thing is that I don't want my code to just break t entirely when it throws an error. Okay. Now, when a try catch, when a try is created, okay, you can see it's highlighting in red here. And you can see the error it gives it. It gives us a nice error, right? It says 
I expected or expected catch or finally. Okay, it needs a catch statement or a finally statement. Okay, more particularly a catch statement. So we'll say catch, and then we put two more curly brackets. Okay. So now you see the errors went away. Now what's happening? Let's see, cool. So everyone's still happy, okay? So we gave it this code to try, okay? We now need to give it what the catch part does is when an error like this occurs, like this index was outside the bounds of the array, it catches, and there really is no other way to say it, it catches that exception, okay? So you see, I'm just saying the word catch now. I'm not even doing anything else, any other fancy thing. And we're just going to say console.writeline instead of this horrible argument here. Instead of, I mean, not argument, but this horrible thing it prints it out here. You can see this is terrible to read. If you're a user and you see that, you just leave, right? Instead of that, we can just say, sorry, uh, let me say, sorry, something went wrong. Okay, we just say sorry something went wrong okay not too bad okay cool but now remember we still want to say goodbye okay so when I run this it now notice remember before we had the try statement before we had that try statement the code would not print out goodbye okay when something went wrong it just crashed okay because we now have the try statement, when that thing goes wrong, the code still continues to run. Because, like, we put it in a try, so it wasn't committed, you know? It wasn't like, you have to do this. If you put it in a try, it goes, okay, I'm just going to try this out. It might fail, okay? But it's almost like expecting it. If it does fail, I already know what I must do in that catch statement, okay? But if you don't have this try catch, then it doesn't know what it has to do when it breaks, so it just crashes. Okay, it doesn't know where to go. But with the try catch statement, you can say, look, try this out. If it doesn't work, number one, catch what happened. So like remember what went wrong and, and like store that away somewhere. But this is what you must do. Okay, so catch what catch the problem that happened and then just do this. Okay. Cool, everyone's okay with that. Alright. Now just a catch. It, it won't work. It's a try catch. At the very least, it's a try catch. Optionally, you can put finally. Okay. Optionally, you can put finally. So, you can see I don't have a finally statement here. Okay. I don't have a finally statement here. Okay. But, let's say I wanted one. I want to say finally. Okay. Finally. So, what is so? Let's let's explore what's happening here. I'm gonna move the curly brackets onto the same line, so that all of the code can be in the screen. Okay, like that. All right. So we have try. Okay, we give it some code to try. It creates the string as we've seen. We're gonna access it in position one this time. Okay, so when I was accessing it in position two, you see it printed out, sorry, something went wrong, and then it said, goodbye, thank you for using our program. Okay, when I run it and it works, it prints out, Benele, goodbye, thank you for using our program. Okay, so what is the structure defining? Okay, so we say, try, we give it some code to try. Okay, it's not super committed, it'll try it. If it breaks, it's okay. Okay, so usually, if we're creating a database connection, for example, something that requires this very high risk operation, we might call it like we have to go out onto the Internet and we have to connect to this thing. It might break. There's a high chance that something goes wrong. OK, in these cases, we put them in a try okay, so that our code isn't committed to doing them. Okay, so if something goes wrong, it can handle it. OK, then we get the catch and it says, Sorry, something went wrong. You see, now it doesn't break. When when something happens, when an error occurs, it knows what it has to do. It won't crash. It says, sorry, something went wrong. Okay? And then this finally statement, what this does is saying, 
regardless of whether there's an error or not. Okay, after you've tried the thing and after you've caught all the errors, okay, finally, after you've done all of that, finally, just do this always. Okay, always do this. So we do try, okay, we try to print out the name. Okay, if an error occurs, then we go to the catch statement and we'll say, sorry, something went wrong. Okay, and then with, when that's done, okay, whether it goes correctly like it did now, Benele, goodbye, thank you for using our program, or if it breaks and it goes, sorry, something went wrong, goodbye, thank you for using our program. Okay, whether something broke or if nothing broke, go to the finally statements and print out what we want you to print out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the try catch finally block, right? I could have more code here. I could say, I could do other stuff, do other stuff, okay? You can always do other stuff after this, okay? But yeah, basically, after the try catch has occurred, then the finally happens, okay? Yeah, so at the end, at the end of the try catch, okay? And it will always happen. That's the big thing. It will always happen. So... Um, yeah, it will always happen. So when they say things like, <clears throat> so with the question you got exactly in your book, right? I mean, in the test last week, I'm going to reword it a little bit. But what I want you to see is my rewording of it. Okay, in, in your in your test, it was about databases. Okay, I'm not going to reword it about websites. Okay, but what I want you to notice is that it doesn't matter if I'm talking about a website or a database or, you know, anything else, another program, an interface, a controller, whatever I'm talking about, whatever technical language I use, it doesn't matter. It's always the same. Okay, so if I say, okay, you're creating a program, you open super a super complicated connection to another website that has a high chance of failure. Okay, you want to catch the... A page not found error you want to catch an out of memory error you want to catch and I give you all of these names of all these different exceptions okay they there's so many catch statements I can tell you there's four different catch statements all of these different things are happening okay but you need to make sure at the end of your code that you close the connection to the website and that you clean up all the objects that you were using to connect to the website where should you put that closing of the connection and the um, cleanup of all of the objects that you were using. Where should you put them? Always. The answer is always the same. Yes. Finally. Okay. And like with all of these things, if I say, yeah, there's this high risk piece of code, um, you're trying to, I don't know, hack Pentagon. Okay. And it, there's a high chance that it goes wrong. Where should you put this code? Try block. Okay, quite simple. Oh, um, you're trying to catch some exception that you've never even heard of, but that is in the multiple choice. Okay, it's like um, some really convoluted exception. Where would you catch this exception? Or how would you figure out if this exception occurred? Or something like that. How would you handle this exception? You say catch. Okay, it's always the same. All of these complicated things can be around it about databases or websites or arithmetic anything okay, anything but the answers are always the same the try tests it the catch will catch whatever exceptions occurred and the finally just runs always at the end okay so we always do cleanup and closing of connections in the finally statements that's all you have to know about try catch finally okay you don't have to know all the specifics cool one more thing that you might want to see here okay so you see here I printed out, sorry, something went wrong, okay? Instead of that, you can put a little little normal brackets here, as we've seen in other things, okay? And you say exception. You can give a name to the exception if you wanted, okay? So, like, you can specify a more specific exception, like what we saw was an index out of range exception. You can specify... a uh, I don't know, database, not reachable exception. There'll be a whole lot of different types. Divide by zero exception. All of these specific names. If you want to look for those specific exceptions, you can. 
again you don't need to know the specifics of it you just need to know that you can okay you can look for a specific exception you don't need to know how and you don't need to know what which ones okay you just need to know that you can by specifying a name here okay and then you give this name an exception you can call it whatever you want error okay you can call it really terrible thing okay whatever you want to call it okay and then you instead of using this you can actually look at the actual exception okay so i'm going to show you what what that has to do in our simple example here but understand that again it's it's always the same okay so if i run this now so it does break but now instead of printing out sorry something went wrong i print out this exception okay really terrible thing you have you have seen this exception before though okay so system dot index out of range exception index was outside the bounds of the array you should recognize this right as soon as we started this example we saw this error here okay and if i say after this if i just say dot message okay then it will just print out instead of this horrible system dot index out of range exception that's the name by the way so instead of putting exception here you can put whatever the name is here okay it, but again not not it's not too crucial for you to know that okay so we can say just prints out the message and then it prints out the actual message of the exception so now if something else so now more specifically you know what went wrong oh jeez that's a bit crazy you're you're still here though okay um all right so we are we're all good with that that's all we need to know about the try catch finally again guys it's not difficult the questions are worded in a hectic way like they'll put a whole bunch of extra nonsense there but just ignore it just ignore it think about what the try does what the catch does and what the finally does okay anyway cool so that's operators that's try catch finally in the last sort of 15 minutes let's go over loops as someone requested okay and then next time we are going to hit the ground running on section two okay um so what did we want to think about here loops so you guys hmm how should we do this so you want a coverage of all four of the repetition structures even for each Hmm. Okay. Cool, we can do that. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, um, while loops, I guess it kind of ties in a little bit nicely with our discussion of operators. Okay. So you remember we had all of these different operators. Okay. Less than, greater than, um, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Okay. So we have all of these different operators. Um, hopefully you can remember that second set of operators we went through, that set of six. The equals equals, not equals, all of these different operators what they were doing was comparing the thing on the left to the thing on the right and all they would do is if the thing on the left was in some way it, it measures something and it will just tell you true or false okay so like if the thing on the left is greater than the thing on the right then it'll say true otherwise it'll say false okay and there's a bunch of different operators that you can use okay most typically in a while loop we're counting up from zero to something okay so when I say that, so if I say I want my loop to go from 0 to 5, okay, not including 5. Okay, from 0 to 5, not including 5. What do we know about that loop? Okay, we know that it must run on 0. Okay, it must run when whatever this variable is. It must run when it's 0. It must run when it's 1. 
we must run when it's two it must run when it's three it must run when it's four and it must not run when it's five or six or seven or eight or nine okay so when is that loop running okay it's running while this thing whatever this variable is is less than another thing okay, is less than five in this case okay Zero is less than five, one is less than five, two is less than five, three is less than five, four is less than five, five is not less than five, six is not less than five, and so on, all the way up, okay? So this is all the while loop logic is, okay? All you need to do is evaluate the expression inside the while loop, okay? So look, I'm going to say int i equals six. Well, let's say zero. It makes sense to start at zero, always. Okay, int i equals zero. Okay, so immediately you know, okay, this is a variable i, its value is zero initially. Okay, nothing too hectic. If I say i less than three, okay, i less than three. Okay, what this while loop is doing, if you remember back to the if statement, okay, the if statement would say, is the thing in here true? Okay, if it's true, do this. Okay, that's all it was saying. If this is true, do this. Okay, the while loop is basically saying the exact same thing. It's saying, while this is true, do this. Okay, if this is true, do this. While this is true, do this. That's the only difference. Okay, and it's exactly the same way you use the word while. Okay, so as long as that thing inside those brackets is true this while loop will run okay so let me let me show you okay so i'll say console dot right line the condition is true or i'll just let's do it exactly how we did check okay condition is true okay condition is true Ooh, I don't know why I push control s okay so I'm gonna now literally say I'm gonna say <laughs> um, how should I how should I word this okay I'm, I'm gonna create a boolean variable I'm gonna say bool condition okay equals true okay and if I make this condition How long will this run for? Someone tell me. How long will this code run for? While condition console.writeline condition is true. Okay. Forever. Yeah, quite simple. Okay, so all it's doing is checking the code inside that thing. If it's true, it will run. While it's true, it will run. Okay. So if I change this to false, okay, hopefully you can see how, how many times will this run. It'll say the first time it gets it, it'll say while condition. And condition is immediately false. So it just stops. Okay. Cool. So now let's look at this okay so if i say int i equals zero so we're starting at zero and i say i less than three okay cool i'm going to stop there now but now you must read this carefully because these are the kinds of things they'll give you okay how many times will this run int i equals three I less than three. How many times will that run? This code here. How many times will that loop run? Anyone? How many times will this loop run? Int i equals zero while i is less than three. What does that i less than three operator do? What does that less than operator do? Yes, okay, everyone's saying forever now. That's correct, okay? This will run forever. Why will it run forever? 
because we say int i is equal to 0, then we say, okay, while i is less than 3, what is i's value? It's 0, okay? So the computer just puts 0 there. 0 less than 3, that's true, okay? So it runs this command, condition is true, and it'll just run that forever, okay? It's never going to stop. Why? Because we never add 1 to i. We don't do anything with i. i's value is always 0, okay? And 0 is always less than 3. Okay, so the condition never becomes false. And the while loop will only stop when that condition becomes false. Okay, so if I say now i plus plus, okay, we know what the plus plus means. It adds 1 to i. Okay. Now, now I'm actually willing to run this because we're using .NET Fiddle. I don't want it to break. Um, you can see it runs three times. How did we know it ran three times? And how could we know that when we're asked, we're asked this in a multiple choice test, okay? So the, the number one thing I would say that you must do is write out the loop, okay? Do some workings out and actually like calculate what it is, okay? Because in a multiple choice test, you're gonna be given like, is it three, four, or two, okay? And it might be a bit tricky, okay, for you to tell. The one way you can tell very easily, you analyze, okay, so it's adding one, right? And it starts at zero, okay? We just need to find out when is this true? How many times is this true, okay? Zero is less than three, okay? So it's true the first time, so it runs, okay? The second time we've added one to i, okay? So i is now just one, okay? One is less than three, so it runs a second time, okay? We've now added 1 to i again, so i is now 2. 2 is less than 3, so it runs a third time. Okay. We now added um, 1 to i again, so it's 3. Okay. Is 3 less than 3? No, that's now false. Okay. So, bam, we've now discovered, okay, so this loop runs 3 times. Okay. The other way of doing this, but you have to be careful about this, okay? And I'm going to show you in what ways you must be careful, okay? If this is a less than, okay? If it's a less than, okay, less than. So just what, not less than or equal to, less than, okay? If it's less than, then you can say the end of the loop, 3, minus the start of the loop, 0, okay? And that will give you your answer. It will run 3 times, okay? 3 minus 0 is 3. Okay, likewise, if I changed it to start at 1, this loop will run 3 minus 1 times, 2 times. If I started at 2, this will run um, 3 minus 2 times, once. If I started at 3, 3 minus 3 times, it will run 0 times. Okay, it won't work, obviously, when you make i go past, because it can't run minus 1 times or whatever, but you know what I mean. Okay, so you can say end minus start. Okay. If it is less than, right? If it is less than. If it is not less than. So if we say 0 less than or equal to, okay, less than or equal to, then, okay, it runs on 0, as we saw before. It adds 1 to it, okay? It runs on 1, as we saw before, okay? It adds 1 to it. It runs on 2, as we saw before. Now i's value is 3, it now runs on 3 as well, okay? So that rule of end minus start no longer works when it's less than or equal to, okay? It's now end minus start plus 1, okay? Also, you have to be careful, and this is why I'm saying you must always write out the loop and actually do the workings out because the other thing to be very careful about is when because so far the loops you've seen have always been i plus plus or i equals i plus one okay so adding one but what if it's i equals i plus two okay because then we run on zero and we run on two okay so now we've only running twice okay if, if it's adding two instead right so you must be careful about these things but the fundamental logic of the loops is very simple okay, it's very simple you just have to analyze when that statement inside those normal brackets is true and when it is false and how long it is true for. Okay, so that's the while loop. All right. Now, the do while loop. Uh, 
And I think this is the last one we'll have time for, although this shouldn't take us very long. Okay. The do while loop is... <laughs> it's essentially, in terms of like running for long periods of time, so if you're running more than once, it's identical. Okay, you don't have to... The fact that it's a do while loop means nothing in that case. Okay. Um, when you're running for like these longer periods. But the only difference with this do while loop, okay? Look, I, I'll show it like this. I'm gonna create bool. Okay, I'm gonna call it check, and I'm gonna make it equal false. Okay, just to make it really clear. Okay, this is false. Alright? If I put this in the condition of a while loop, it would not run. Right? If I put it in a condition of a do while loop, so I put false here. I put the word false there. You'll see this will still print out. Condition is true. Let me call this condition rather. You see, so it's the computer read it. It said do. Okay, it did this. It did it. Then it came to the while and was like while false and stopped. Okay. Oh, oh let me not put false there. Let me put condition. Sorry, that's what I meant. Condition. Okay. So it came to this, and this is false, right? Condition is false. Okay, and then it stopped. It only ran once. If I made condition true, just like a while loop, this would run forever. Okay, because this is always true. So it always goes back to the beginning of the do. Okay. So what we can say, and how they ask this in the test often, is they'll say something like, Okay, um, you need a loop that runs at least once. Okay. Or they'll give you a do while loop and its condition will immediately be false. Like they'll make i equal to 5 and say it runs while i is less than 5. The only thing you have to know that's special about the do while loop is it will always, 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 always run at least once. It can run more, just like a normal while loop. It can go back to the beginning at the do. But it will always run at least once okay at least once even if the condition is immediately false like as we've just seen we set we made condition right here false okay clearly it's false it still ran once and said condition is true okay so the do while loop that's the only difference it runs the first time and then it checks and then it's a just a normal while loop okay so it does the thing and then it checks Whereas a normal while loop will check and then do. Alright? Okay. The other way they like to word it is like um, a loop that checks at the bottom. Okay? And what they mean by bottom is literally the bottom of the loop. Okay? You can see this is our loop structure. Where is our condition? At the bottom. Right? With the while loop, let me just write them out quickly so that we can see before the end of the lesson. Okay? With, with the while loop, we had the condition here, right? Right here. Okay. With the for loop, identical, right? The condition and stuff is right here, right? There's other things around the condition, but the condition is right there. With the for each loop, everything is specified right here, right? The do while loop is the only time the condition is at the bottom, okay? And we mean like this, you know, these normal brackets, these normal brackets. They're at the bottom of the do while loop. Okay, that's all that's saying. Okay. It checks the condition of the bottom first. What do you mean? It's, it runs first. It will always run first and then checks the condition. Okay. Checks the condition at the bottom, at the end of the loop. So at it, the end of each iteration. But I mean, don't... Don't think about it. You can literally just read it. Okay, so look. It says do. The computer says do. Okay, and it does the, It does it. It just does it. it. The computer doesn't say do if or do while. It just says do. Okay, and then it gives it the code to do. And the computer does it. And then it sees while and goes, oh, condition. Okay, so if this condition was true, it would say do. Okay, it won't even look at the condition yet. It doesn't care yet. Okay. And it will say, okay, I'm doing this. I print out condition is true. Okay, I get to the end of my loop. And then I see, oh, while true. Okay, so in this case, it'll continually run forever. 
okay, and go back to the beginning of the do. But if we say false, still, okay, it comes to this do, it gets it gets the code and it just runs it. It goes, okay, cool, I'm running it. You said you said do, okay, do this, and then it goes while. Oh, okay, and then it sees while false, and it immediately stops, and then it will just continue here. Okay, yeah, continue. Okay, it just continues running whatever other code is in the block. Okay, that's the only difference. The do while loop will just run at least once. Okay, even if the condition is false, the do while loop will run at least once. Okay, it can run exactly like a normal while loop. Okay, it can like just like a while loop it can count to three right with if you give it i less than three it's still going to run for zero one and two okay it's just that if it was running while i less than zero okay and i was initially zero a normal while loop wouldn't run okay but the do while loop will run once and then it will only see that it was supposed to run while i was less than zero okay so the do while loop just checks at the bottom Okay. checks at the bottom, checks at the end, checks after the first iteration, however you want to say it, um, it will run at least once. Okay, We'll go over the for loop again next week, just for the first like 10-15 minutes. But guys, the, the logic for loops, they might look intimidating, but really in tests, it's just, it's just patience analyzing those loops. Okay, You just have to write them out. There's nothing logically difficult. Okay, you just have to go through and go, when is the simple statement? And it's something like I less than three, right? You know the numbers that are less than three. So all you have to ask is, when will I let be less than three? How often will I be less than three? If they say I less than 100, same thing. It's just about the patience of going through, um, like, okay, when when will this be the true? Okay, when will that statement be true? When will it be false? Okay. And that's why, like, a lot of these other questions, right? So one of the questions they gave in the test um, was, like, while um, i equals... Okay, we'll stop right after this because we are going over time. Okay, so while i less than 5, for example. So they gave you something like this, okay? Uh, ooh, int i, sorry. Okay, int i equals zero, cool. And they and they and you see, ooh, I don't add one to i, so this will run forever. Whoops. Okay, didn't add one to i. Okay, so we see this runs one, two, three, four, five times. They gave you something like this. I think they had i less than or equal to maybe. Yeah, they had this, and they were like, oh, we only want to run. They we want this to run five times. Okay. We want this to run five times, and you can see it run six. And to see this run six is very simple, right? Um, either you can use the just subtraction trick, right? It's less than or equal to. So you would say end minus start, five minus zero, plus one, six. Okay. Um, the other way of doing it, how I think you should do it, is write out the loop and go through the logic. When will I be less than or equal to five if it starts at zero? How many times? It's zero is less than or equal to five. 1 is less than or equal to 5, 2 is less than or equal to 5, 3 is less than or equal to 5, 5 is less than or equal to 5, okay? Oh, did I skip 1? I think I skipped 1. Yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, yeah, th 4, I skipped 4. Why did I skip 4? I guess I'm tired too. Okay, so it's, it's 0, uh, i is less than or equal to 5, so 6 times. Okay, from 0, 1, 0, 0 is 1, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times. That's all you have to do. You write out the loop, you just count out the number of times i will be less than 0. I mean, i will be less than or equal to 5. Okay, so the other way of phrasing it, how many numbers are there between 0 and 5, including 0 and 5? Okay, 6. Okay, there's lots of ways of phrasing it. You just have to pick your favorite one. But all of them take time. Okay, you have to write out the loop and actually analyze it. Okay, um, and but then with this question, they said, how, t how can I make this run only five times? So currently it runs six times. There's two obvious ways. Okay, one of them is just removing the less, the less than or equal to. Okay, just make it less than. Now it will run five times instead of six.
okay? They didn't give you that option in the multiple choice. The options they gave were make this i equals equals 5. Okay, will that work? No, of course not. We know what the equals equals operator does, right? This will only run while i equals 5. And i is initially 0, so i will never equal 5. Okay, because the loop never runs. So it just doesn't run at all. That's the one option they gave you. The other option they gave you was like i greater than or equal to 5. When is i greater than or equal to 5 in this case? It just never, right? Because it never runs. So we never get to this point where we add 1. Okay. Cool. And then the other option they gave was make this 1. Make it start at 1. Yes, a very obvious solution, right? You would say 5 minus 1 plus 1, that's 5. Okay, so this will run 5 times. And we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, but all of these things you have to, you have to analyze. Okay, you can't just guess them. Okay, anyway, I think that settles us for today. Sorry, we went a bit over time. Um, and yeah, so next week I'll go over the for loop in the beginning, just quick. And we'll just see how these tricks still apply in those cases. Okay, cool. All right, goodbye, guys. See you next week. Um, and ooh, yeah, so next week we'll be back to two o'clock. Okay, and I'll add the people who aren't on the WhatsApp group. But remember to Ziran, if you if you haven't sent me your phone number, please do, um, so I can add you to the WhatsApp group. Okay, cool. Enjoy enjoy the rest of your week, guys. See you next week. Enjoy enjoy your weekend as well. Um, cheers.